Good morning. So, uh, you guys ready for Petra? Yes. Yeah. I mean, one of one of my highlights, one of the things that I'm really looking forward to, is tomorrow, and, and I'm excited that we're all able to share this together. I heard um, on the TV they announced 500 and. 510, but then that doesn't even include those that are going privately, so uh, I'm guessing we're going to be really close to 80%, 85% of the ship going tomorrow, which is really cool, um, and it's going to look absolutely nothing like that one, uh, because there are going to be a few thousand of our closest friends with us, um, so let me start by just saying it doesn't matter. If there are 3,000 people there of which, let's say 800 of us and then a whole bunch of canard folks, not a problem. Just wipe them out of your picture a little bit if possible, but um, it's big enough for that many people. Uh, it's not going to diminish the experience, so, so don't let that worry you or make you nervous in any way. It's going to be great. Um, but I do have one well small thing here. Um, <laughs> I know uh, I that the first thing you thought of when you thought of Petra was these guys riding away from the treasury after they have found uh, the Holy Grail. Uh, and while we're not going to find the whole Holy Grail, we are going to be able to get some pictures like them. Uh, the other part that I want to start with is a small thing that I do on every cruise. Uh, it's called the Resident Historian Hall of Fame. Uh, and this is your scavenger hunt for history. Uh, and so on each cruise, I do one item. And so for this one, it is going to be the first passenger or group of passengers who send me a picture of you or your team by a camel in front of the treasury in Petra. So take a picture of this slide if you want to be considered for the Viking Resident Historian Hall of Fame. The glory of this, by the way, you win absolutely nothing. But you do get the perpetual honor of on this world cruise being part of the Hall of Fame. Uh, and you would either need to WhatsApp or text me a picture at that number, send it to me by email at that address, and then I'm going to post it with a little bit of history about Petra and your picture on my blog site, which is Renaissance Life. Um, and you'll join a, a host of folks who have been at uh, the Mount Olympus, uh, lighting the flame, uh, or other spots around, around the world. Uh, and and I, I'm telling you, you'll have notoriety because my blog site has at least 13, maybe even 14 people who follow it. So, you know, <laughs> Somewhere in the world, somebody might come up to you and say, I saw you there. Uh, but this is for the resident historian on my leg of the trip. Um, but to talk about the treasury, because I think at least 80% of us, if we said, all right, we're going to go to Petra, uh, the two things that you thought about were first, we've got all these beautiful red carving rocks. I want to see those. I want to see where Indiana Jones was, and I want to see the treasury. Uh, now, most of us don't have really no clue what the treasury is, but we know it by name, and we know what it looks like, and this is what it looks like on the left with a small group of people. We'll have some more people tomorrow. Uh, but it is not a treasury. It, it is, in fact, a mortuary or a funeral place for uh, King Aratos IV from the first century A.D. So he had, and when you see all of these cut tombs, they're really tombs that have beautiful, ornate fronts and then very bland uh, interiors. Uh, and so for this one, uh, we see that it has all kinds of different artifacts out front. We'll talk, talk about those. And then on top, it has this little urn. We're going to see. There it goes. And it, whoops. One more time. Maybe there, that one, right up on, on, on top is an urn. And there were two rumors that were started. The first is in that urn are all the riches of Egypt. That the Pharaoh who was chasing Moses 
actually to hide his treasure while he was out trying to find Moses in the desert actually put his treasure in this urn on top of there and if you could just get up there and break it you would have all of the treasure of Egypt uh, well the dates don't quite work because Moses is somewhere 1200 1400 BC this was built 100 AD so so that one is a great story but eh, maybe not uh, the second was uh, King Aratos they said he put all of his wealth put it in the urn and kept it on top of his tomb and there are stories of Bedouin before rifles actually taking arrows shooting it up at the urn hoping it would open and then the wealth would fall down then after guns there are actually hundreds of gunshots on this urn where people would sit down below and take a rifle and shoot at it uh, now they actually know for a definitive fact it is just a piece of rock and has no treasure in it and they have outlawed the practice of trying to shoot at it any further um, but it's a pretty cool story but and it gives us this name the treasury uh, in addition up on top you'll see the remains of four eagles that are there and the idea is that the eagle would carry your soul to heaven uh, and so they're there on top to signify that that the king has died but his soul is going to be taken beyond then in the middle we have on either side there are actually three outward panels and then two kind of recessed panels and on the outer side of that, we see dancing Amazons. And these dancing Am Amazons have a two-headed axe. Uh, and they're dancing to really talk about how he is still alive and that he is still powerful even in death. And then finally at the bottom, we have these twins, Castor and Pollux, uh, who split their time in Greek mythology between Olympus and the underworld. Uh, and so the beautiful part of this, as I see it, is on top, we have something lifting you up and heading to another place. At the bottom, we have this mythological ideal of life after death moving down to the underworld. So we have it moving both ways, and then in the middle, we have vibrance. Uh, so as they made this it is really spectacular uh, and this is that drawing but on the right hand side you'll see as you go in you're expecting something that is as opulent and beautiful and as well planned on the inside as they have on the outside uh, and yet on the inside there are just really these three cham chambers that are rough cut stone uh, and tomorrow it's not going to be quite as hot but if it were a hundred degrees outside one of the cool parts is you walk inside and it's already 30 degrees cooler uh, and so as if you do get hot tomorrow find the nearest tomb and just walk inside for a few minutes because it will cool right off so we have the treasury it also has these and I've got a little drawing on top from the um, archaeological sketches they are Corinthian columns and as you look at this one of the things that I do want to kind of drive home is that while Petra to us is part of Jordan and part of the desert and, and very kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Jordan and at, at the time Petra was really cosmopolitan and they traded throughout all of the Mediterranean. They traded along the Silk Route. Uh, and so the knowledge base and the artistry that they had was incredibly Greek. So they're picking up not only these Greek Delta type roof columns here in the middle, but they're also picking up Corinthian pillars. So for a place that's in the desert, it's actually very Greco-Roman in its style. So uh, this morning, I want to just take a few minutes and we'll, we'll start with some prehistory and some preliminary comments on geography. Uh, we'll talk about the Nabataeans. We'll talk about the Romans. We'll look at Islam and then the Crusades. And then finally, what will be most important to you is 10 tips about tomorrow and what you might do to make tomorrow an even better experience. Uh, but to start with, there, there's this quote that I really love um, that comes from Lawrence of Arabia. 
So we've all heard of Lawrence of Arabia in some other lectures of ours, but he writes to a friend, Petra is the most wonderful place in the world. Not for the sake of the ruins, which are quite a secondary affair, but for the colors of its rocks. All red and black and gray with streaks of green and blue in little wiggly lines. And for the shape of its cliffs and crags and pinnacles and for the wonderful gorge it has, always running deep with spring water full of oleanders and ivy and ferns and only just wide enough for a camel at a time uh, and a couple of miles long. But I have read hosts of the most beautiful accounts of it and they give one no idea of it at all. So you will never know what Petra is like unless you come out here. Only be assured that till you have seen it, you have not had the glimmering of an idea of how beautiful a place it might be. A and so even Lawrence, who, who has seen the world and gone to Oxford and, and has been an archaeologist, he is so struck when he is writing a friend that he said, you've heard about Petra, but you don't have a clue until you get out here. And the beautiful part is tomorrow we all get to have a clue. Um, so if, if we look at Wadi Rum, which is kind of where we're going to dock, uh, coming up the Jordan Trail, we're going to come to Petra, which this does not work at all when I do that. So not there, but um, over here somewhere. That's, uh, so Petra, now I've got the little thingy. Man, I have got really cool gizmos that do not work right. And I know it's operator error, by the way. I, I'm just blaming it on someone else. But we have these uh, rocks. We have lots of different geological structures uh, that are great as we go in. We have this sandstone and limestone, which is the predominant rock. We do have chalk and merle and chert. Uh, we have iron oxide. Uh, and I'm going to advance and then go that way. That, that should get rid of here. So uh, we have chalk and merle. Uh, we have iron oxide. The plateaus are 2,400 feet up to about 4,500 feet tall. So they're actually pretty tall as we go in and kind of wind our way through. Rainfall about two inches a year. Uh, they do say we've got about a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. I would really doubt that that materializes. If it does, uh, I mean, definitely take precautions, but it's likely to be very, very light and very, very short-lived. So uh, if you don't mind getting wet, it won't take long. And then temperatures are between 50 and 105 degrees. I really thought we were going to be in the high 80s, which can feel pretty warm, but it sounds like we're going to be maybe even in the low 80s or high 70s tomorrow, uh, which will be amazing. So we're all going to have, I think, a great experience. And if we do have a little bit of cloud cover, that'll be even better for some of our photos. Um, as we look at um, the Silk Road and the Spice Road, we've talked about Mecca and Saudi Arabia. Uh, but in fact, the Spice Road came up from the south through the Arabian Peninsula up to Petra, and then it split off east and west, which made it a really vital uh, trade point because people would come up to Petra and either go left over to Alexandria or go right and head up over into Constantinople. So the Silk Road and the spice trade came through Petra, making them incredibly wealthy as merchants who were able to arrange transportation from Saudi Arabia or, or from the Arabian Peninsula up into Europe. Uh, we do have really early evidence of humans living in the area going back to 40,000 BC. Uh, and then by 4000 BC, the Natufian culture actually comes down and you start to see these round Natufian style huts. Uh, we see some other square styled huts, which is 
kind of rare to see both round and square dating back to 4,000. They're cultivating uh, emer wheat. They're cultivating others. They're domesticating livestock. So as the Levant is beginning to cultivate and domesticate at 4,000 BC, we're seeing the exact same thing in Petra. And I think even then, we're seeing the beginnings of these trade routes and the importance of Petra. Uh, in, in addition, Petra is seen as Edom. So for those who have spent any time in the Bible at all, the Edomites are a really important group uh, that are talked about over and over. And the capital of Edom is Petra. So whenever you hear about Edom, uh, it is there. And in, in addition, Petra and the Edomites become really important to the Egyptians. The Egyptians like copper, and the copper mines are coming out of mines that are near Petra. So we see tool production, cop copper tools. We see these mines that are being used predominantly by Egypt, but also throughout time by Israel. We see trade, frankincense uh, is being uh, brought through this area and mined in this area. Uh, biblical connections, just a whole host of biblical connections that, that plague the area or at least impact the area all the way through the Crusades. Because part of it, you might say, why would the Crusades even matter? Why would they come all the way into this rocky, hidden area of Petra? And it's because the spring of Moses in Numbers, uh, Moses gets angry with, with the people when they're grumbling. And if you've read through Exodus and Numbers, you'll see that Moses gets angry with the people a lot. Um, and, and it's like, you're thirsty and you're hungry. Get over it. We just, God said to go. And they, they grumble. And at one point, Moses gets so angry that he says, you're thirsty? And he takes his staff and he hits a rock and says, there will be water. And God honors that. And in fact, a spring comes up out of the rock uh, and it is known as Ain Musa, the spring of Moses. And so Petra is founded at this site that we have this really, and it's flowing now, uh, spring that they attribute to Moses. It's also just behind, we have Mount Seir and Mount Hor, and uh, we have Jebel Nebi Haran, or Harun, which is where Moses' brother Aaron is supposedly buried. So two really big biblical connections going all the way back to Moses and Aaron and the Exodus are at Petra. In addition, there are 42 different locations that during the Exodus, when the Israelites were wandering around in the desert for 40 years, eight of those 42 sites are in and around Petra. Petra. So the Israelites, then the Hebrews, as they were coming out of Egypt, spent a lot of time in this region. Uh, also, if we look at Edom as a location and Petra as its capital, King David later conquered Edom. Uh, King A Amaziah took Petra and this mountain behind, he supposedly took 10,000 Edomites and pushed them off and killed them. So lots of different Old Testament biblical connections going back to the area. If we then look at the Nab Nabataeans. So in the 6th century BC, we have them being conquered by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians were really big on when they conquered you, they took a significant portion of your population and brought you back to Babylon. That, in fact, again, bi biblically with the connections, uh, when Israel is conquered by Babylon at about the same time, they take half of the Israelites and take them up to Babylon, and then they take a whole bunch of Babylonians and bring them down into Israel. They intermarry, and that's how we get the Sumerians. So um, as we look at it, this is that same time when the Babylonians are moving south and taking territory. Well, they didn't backfill Petra and left it 
pretty much empty. And at the same time, then, it's thought that the Nabataeans, a kind of pastoral nomad um, group, comes up from the Arabian Peninsula and settles in Petra. This is also as we move to the New Testament time period around um, the first century A.D., we see trade in incense, myrrh, root spices, bitumen, and that makes you think of the wise men. And it has been at least put forward, not everyone agrees, but it's been put forward that in fact the wise men were from Petra and the ones that came from the east uh, when Jesus was born. So it is at least possible that this is the area where these wise men came with frankincense and myrrh and incense. Uh, among the wealthiest of all Arabs at the time because Petra is able to get the best of Asia, the best of the spices, and the best of China and move it all through their area at discount prices. So uh, they are very, very wealthy. They're also really, really smart. If you're in the desert, your number one thing you need is water. Uh, and one of the things we'll see as we walk down are these cut uh, channels. And they use the viscosity of water that as it actually rolls off these high cliffs, it tries to hug. And they created one of the first gutter systems to be able to collect all the water that does roll in and then they channeled it through these gutters into cisterns and they created enough water that they were totally self-sufficient on water and they had all of these wells underneath in addition. So while the desert around them was inhospitable, they had water to not only sustain themselves but water for agriculture. Uh, which made Petra a incredibly sought after location. And when Romans or other armies came to attack, they would then destroy or cover up the wells outside the city and they would have plenty of water during the siege while all of these invading armies would dry of thirst. So they were really rarely captured from the outside because they could disguise water source. Uh, wine was for forbidden, which on this cruise would be a problem. Uh, but as we look at it, uh, they, they did use kind of a fermented honey, almost, almost it's not ale, mead. They had, had a mead-like product that, that they did use, but they used uh, wild honey mixed with water for drinking. Uh, dietary, they, they ate meat, milk, and plants, all produced locally. So as we, we look at it, uh, they were really, as a, the Nabataean group goes, they didn't have the hierarchy that other kingdoms had. And I'm not going to read this because it's just way too long. But Strabo, who is a historian um, and does a wonderful job, visits. And, and he talks about this idea that they are a sensible people. Uh, and, and one of the things that I love is they're sensible and capitalistic. They, that if you, in fact lose money, you squander your wealth, they publicly humiliate you. How would you like that? Stock market goes down and everybody goes, dude, come on, you could do better than that. Uh, but, but if you do really well with your trading business, then you're raised up and, and you're honored and then they talk and they say wonderful things about you. But they're not so haughty that in fact, uh, on this next one it talks about that, that if you come to visit like Strabo did, they don't have servants come and serve you. They come and serve you. In fact, the king might walk up and pour drinks for you, which is really cool. And he was struck by the fact that, that the king would sit down and talk and people would actually critique him back to him. And it's like this is a really open society that values wealth and success uh, and wants you to be the best that you can be. So he's struck by the Nab Nabataeans. Uh, and th this er King er Eratos that we ta talked about from his period, there is a tremendous amount of religious activity going on. Here is the Temple of the Winged Lions. Uh, this one is probably too far to walk to, uh, but you might be able to see it as you get a bit past the amphitheater. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they were polytheistic. 
So uh, even though we have the well of Moses there, um, we have lots of other gods in the region. We have Dushara in the top center, and he's kind of the big male god. He has three consort female gods like Manat, Aluza, and Alot. Uh, in addition, they have Greek gods. So we have at least two examples. This is one of them of Isis, and this is Isis Tyche. Um, but they, are, they have Greek gods. They have local kind of Levant type gods. Uh, we do see some Baal uh, there as well, just like you would see in Israel. Uh, and then there is, there is also some discussion of Yahweh, even though there is not anything that we, we can find in a graven image. Um, most of the cut types of things that we see are going to be tombs and would love for you to look for three different styles that you'll find as we go through. First really is a, um, Israel or a Egyptian style and we would call that a pylon style. You're going to see that again when we get to Luxor. As you go to Karnak, you're going to see these things called pylons. And pylons are nothing more than an upward jetting kind of structure like we see on the upper left. So you'll see multiple pylons. That's style one. Style two is a step style, and we're going to see it in two varieties. Here's a downward stepping style, uh, and then we also see an upward stepping. Now, the downward stepping is another Egyptian influence. Egypt has this same idea where it has the Nile River cutting through Egypt, and then we have the West and the East Bank, uh, and one is death and one is life, that as the sun comes up on the East, that is new life coming, and as it crosses the Nile and goes down on the West, it is death, and we have that same idea here in a step style, and then and the, and the upper left... I'll come back and see if I can do it that way. Nope. Okay. Uh, we see a lot of Greco-Roman influence. And for that, you're going to see Corinthian columns. Uh, you're going to see that, that delta type of arch that we have in Greece. But we're going to see a lot of Greco-Roman influence. So those are the three. Now, again, as you go in, you're going to expect something really wonderful. And you're going to see the lower left. You're going to see something that is just really just rough cut kind of tomb. Then we look at the Roman era. Um, we do, Rome calls it Arab Petria, which means rock. Uh, and they have the Petra as the head. There is Roman road construction, and we'll show a picture of that in a second. Sassanid Persia comes in in the 3rd century AD. Uh, I did want to throw in that on December 25th of each year, so similar to how we have Christmas, they had the festival for the virgin Ka'abu uh, and her offspring Dushara. Um, it, is, it is like the Roman Sat Saturnalia festival, which has closer ties to uh, Christmas, uh, but they did have this midwinter solstice kind of event even here in Petra. And then by the late 300s into the 4th century AD, we see Petra in decline. Um, another just really quick story, and this, there are just so many ties back to, to, to the Bible here. Uh, King Herod. King Herod is a, is a big feature playing in the Bible. Um, it is he and Herod the Great uh, who are the ones that try to kill Jesus when he's little. Uh, King Herod has a daughter, Salome. And, and I may be pronouncing that wrong, but I think that's right, Salome. Uh, and he has a daughter. Well, one of the princes of Petra is named Seleus. And Seleus falls in love with Salome. And uh, he wants to marry her, and she thinks he's pretty cool too, so she's down for that. And he comes to King Herod and says, King, you know, to, to create between Edom and between Israel, let's create, you know, this mighty Nabataean Edomite uh, kind of, kind of, of, of alliance. Let me marry your daughter. And he says, that's fine. You just have to become a Jew. And, and if you can do that and be circumcised, then, in fact, I will give you her hand in marriage. And he says, yeah, I, I, I can't do that. <laughs> 
they will stone me if I go home like that. And so King Herod says no. So what does any well-meaning young man do? He goes to Rome and goes to Caesar and says, I'm going to get this Herod guy. And so he goes to Rome and he meets with Caesar and he stays there for several months. And he starts to say, you know, I'm getting these messages that Israel is attacking my people. And, and we have the Pax Romana. Rome is supposed to keep everything calm. And, and he's bra- this guy, he's bad. You know, and, and, and Caesar begins to believe it and believe that, in fact, Israel uh, is really a troublemaker and causing problems. Uh, And he starts to decide what he might do. And and Petra hears word about it. And and the king of Petra sends a note and emissaries to Caesar. And Caesar refuses him and says, you know, until you change your ways, I don't even want to meet with you. Because this guy, Sylleus, is is telling us about all the horrible things you're doing. Uh, Well, The king of Israel then gets with the delegation of Petra, comes to Caesar, and convinces him that Sylleus is the problem. And so he is then executed for treason and for trying to be a troublemaker. Uh, You would think the story ends there, but it actually goes on. And I'm sure some of you know, why is Salome known? John the Baptist, that in fact, she continues to be a bit of a troublemaker on her own, and she's the one who goes to her father and says, this John the Baptist guy, I want his head. And they cut off John the Baptist's head and give it to her. So Petra is involved in the Bible in lots of different ways. Uh, We also have the the Roman road. If you look at that red line coming up from Syria all the way down and across uh, into Egypt, the main Roman road of the area comes right through Petra. And we should have enough time for you to walk around and, in fact, see that Roman road. Uh, you'll, You'll know it. Roman roads are very distinctive. They're flat, they're straight, uh, and they usually have columns somewhere in the neighborhood. So if you find something flat, straight, and has columns, you're probably on the Roman road of Petra. Uh, The Romans also built the largest pure rock-cut tomb, I mean rock-cut theater in all of the Mediterranean. So if you have time, work your way over to the amphitheater. It is absolutely beautiful. If you look at the back, you'll notice there are like box seats cut out of that. It's because they kept growing and you can kind of see it in in the shadow. There was actually a two-tiered amphitheater and it was so popular that they added a third tier to the amphitheater. But in doing it, they took out a whole bunch of tombs and they cut their way back into the mountain. And so all of what looks like box seats in back were actually the inside of someone's tomb where the front got taken away. So the amphitheater there, we also have a Roman bath on the left. Um, During the Byzantine time, we have some beautiful chapels, the Blue Chapel, uh, the Blue Chapel, the Byzantine Church of Petra, and the Ridge Church, all dating from the second up to the sixth century A.D. Many of which have some beautiful mosaics. Now, to get there, you would have to really book it tomorrow. So, only if you have no mobility issues. And is John in here the guy who does the triathlons? He didn't raise his hand somewhere there is one guy i know who can get here so if he can run and make it that would be great um moving on to islam and the crusaders um islam comes in shortly after the seventh century a.d um and because islam is there when the crusaders come and because it's where aaron is buried in the well of moses the crusaders move into petra they take over they build three forts that are still evident today, at least the remains are there, uh, that can be be viewed. So as we walk through on top of some, some of these hills, your guide might talk about a few of the crusader forts. Now, finally, um, to be rediscovered. Uh, from really the 5th century A.D., Up until the 1700s, Petra became a rumored city that people thought might exist, but they weren't even sure. 
that it was to the Western world it was forgotten. And this guy, Burkhard, uh, is a Swiss. And it, it, the real quick story is in his teens, he moves from Sw Switzerland and he goes to England and he wants to be a foreign civil servant. Well, he can't get hired as that. So he becomes an assistant to an engineer uh, that is going to be working out of Cairo. Uh, so on his way to Cairo, he hears about Petra. And he wants to be able to see it. He's done all of this language training. So he knows the customs. He knows the language. He dresses like a local. He changes his name to Sheikh Ibrahim Abin uh, Abdallah. Really horrible pronunciation. But he changes his name. He grows his beard. He's tanned. He speaks the language. And he tells the guy who is taking him to Cairo that he really wants to go to where Aaron is buried and he wants to sacrifice a goat and the guy goes fine we'll take a quick detour and they take him to Petra uh, and he doesn't want to be uh, uncovered as a Westerner because typically any Westerner who, who has tried to find Petra is either killed or robbed and sent on their way so he tries very quietly as he's walking around to make notes and then he goes and he sacrifices a goat to Aaron he comes back through he makes a few more notes he brings it back to the Western world and now people know where it is and a little bit about what it looks looks like but it takes another 80 years uh, until in fact others go in and begin to draw it and begin archaeology so it was lost for over a thousand years uh, and then only really brought back by the late 1800s where folks began to know that Petra was in fact a real place so then I wanted to just talk about a couple of tips for tomorrow because if it were warm, I don't want people to get stranded. So here are some things. First, be prepared to walk. That it, you could easily do four miles walking tomorrow. Um, so be sh so wear comfortable shoes. It, this is not a day for flip flops. This is not a day for fashion putting on your 10 tennis shoes and socks and being willing to walk. Uh, time is short, so walking quickly, especially when your tour guide gives you some free time, will be important. Uh, extra water and snacks. It is a great day to take a backpack. Uh, I would take two waters, not one. One water down, one water back. Um, it's not going to be quite as hot and sunny tomorrow, which is great, but I would still take two. I would also take snacks. If you've got something salty, some nu um, nuts or peanuts or, or, or granola bar, tomorrow is a great day to take that uh, because there are some things available, but they're expensive once you get in, uh, so taking an extra snack might be helpful. Um, these are some really dear friends of mine, uh, and they are incredible travelers. Karen was able to get on to top of a camel. It costs, well, depending on how you negotiate, uh, five to ten dollars and in and, and my experience you don't have to pay to get off but but it is five to ten dollars to get up uh, they will take a picture of you that's a dollar maybe a two dollar dollar tip uh, well worth it um, rides back you can take rides down you can take rides back you can do it by camel you can do it by golf cart um, my recommendation is that if you want to maximize your time because time is your enemy. Once you hit that spot, you only have so much time before we've got to come back. So I would maximize my time on site exploring and take the cart back. Now, I know that, that they said they're sometimes not available, and that is true. I've never experienced it. I've always uh, been able to see, and everything I have heard is you can usually catch a golf cart back, $5 again, $10 uh, to bring it back. Uh, but I would check to see how many golf carts are around, and then I would spend every minute I can out exploring. But just be careful because I know we've got to get back. Uh, number five, this is an actual bathroom from there. 
Now, there are better ones. I, I didn't take a picture of the better ones, but uh, not better wins, but better ones. Uh, 50 cents to a dollar sometimes to use a bathroom. So take some, take some ones with you tomorrow. I'll be taking lots of ones, lots of fives, lots of tens. Uh, with me. So whenever I want to do something, I'm not having to worry about it. Uh, I would also definitely bring some extra toilet paper because while some bathrooms have toilet paper, some do not, and it's not our quality. So I would take some from the room with you. I would also bring a little bar of soap with you because you might want to take your water and wash up. Uh, so bathrooms can be a challenge. Definitely bring sun protection. People think of it as being in these cliffs. And it is as you walk down, but once you get down, it opens way up. And so if the sun is shining, you will get sunburned. Uh, so be sure to bring sun protection with you as well. Um, best picture locations. I have found that in front of the tre treasury is the iconic picture, especially if you want to get on a camel. Uh, as you come in, find one, one of these crags and take a picture, a little sliver of the treasury. Then you get the Indiana Jones picture. I liked this one because there was a little guy sitting at the end. Uh, and then finally, and this will cost you another 10 bucks, but I'm going to pay it because I think it's cool, is if you ask one of the kids at the bottom to take you to climb the king and queen's tomb and get the shot looking down on the treasury from, from, from above, they'll take a picture of you and your significant other sitting on top of the rock with that below. And I think that's a really cool, iconic picture. Uh, and I think this one is the best picture of all, all, all of Petra. So consider these three shots as you're setting up pictures. Uh, the other is bring some extra money. There are things for sale. Um, a couple of warnings. Okay, I still got time. Uh, a couple of, of warnings as well. Uh, on the left and on the right, you'll see some really pretty bowls and trinkets. Most of them are from Turkey. Some are from China. Um, so be careful what you're buying and look at kind of where it comes from. They are pretty. Uh, the stones are often local, but not always. So the things across the top are cool trinkets to come back. I think that the real bring home thing from Petra is while you're there, there are shops where people have taken different sands from the region and they create art in a bottle. It's definitely local. It's definitely handmade. It's not all that expensive. I've forgotten. It may be $10, $20. Uh, but you get a nice uh, desert scene that they have created with the sand. Uh, and I think that's a really great memento to bring home from Petra. Uh, num number nine, keep, t keep moving. Time is limited. Often we only get a half an hour or 45 minutes on our own, and that includes shopping time. So if you want to get out of here and go see the amphitheater, which I think is great, or some of the other idols or forts, make sure you're, you're moving quickly and keeping track of time. Finally, it is a UNESCO site. And what that means is they are trying to preserve it. And predominantly, what are they trying to preserve it from? And the answer is us that we're the ones who are causing the most damage. So keep in mind that we do want to create this site for the next generation as well. And just make sure to pack all, all your trash back. Uh, don't take cuttings off the rocks and all of those things. Just preserve it as best we can. Uh, so in summary, it's spectacular beauty and mystery. It's a burial, a burial place of, of Aaron and the Spring of Moses. It has rich history as Silk Road treasures. It had influence from Rome, occupied by the Crusaders, rediscovered by Europe, and now available to us as a UNESCO site. So with that in mind, guys, have a great time tomorrow. I can't wait. Have a good day.